Yeah, wow, we've got a great, great group of people here today. Uh, Tracy from Michigan, Carrie from Chesterfield, Virginia. Thank you all for joining. Uh, you know, we got a great group here, so I'm um, excited to tell you about composting um, and, and, um, and hopefully help you start your own compost pile or start your own composting um, if you'd like to be doing that. Caitlin from uh, Cumberland, Maryland. Um, Karen from Gordonsville, Virginia. And Kathy, hi. So, all right, so I'm going to get started here um, and, and hopefully give you some um, really good tips and tricks and different ideas of how you can start composting um, uh, in your yard, um, in your home. Lots of different options here. We've got lots of different things. Um, I, I want to start off by just talking about compost in general. Um, composting can be very fun, it can be very easy. Uh, we can get very detailed if we need to. I'm going to try and keep it very simple and very basic so that you have just kind of the basic ideas of how to compost. Um, and we'll keep it very, very simple as much as I possibly can. And I'll try and go through this fairly quickly so that I can open it up for questions at the end. I know you all will probably have lots of questions um, because a lot of composting becomes very specific to your area, to what you're trying to compost, different things like that. So please feel free to ask questions throughout the seminar. I will, at the very end, uh, get to everybody's questions um, and make sure to try and answer them as best as I can. Um, so it can be very easy. It's, it's very rewarding, um, and it's very helpful to the environment. Um, so today we'll be talking about the basics again, how you can do it easily and efficiently. Um, the benefits of compost are huge. Um, I think uh, if you've ever used compost before, you know the benefits of it. Um, one of the major things that soil that we use, or our soil in our yards, or our soil in our, comp, in, in our uh, raised beds, um, need organic matter. And organic matter is compost. Um, and compost can come from a lot of different areas. Um, so uh, we want to make sure that we're composting and using compost to add organic matter to our soil. It's a very important thing. It holds in moisture. It'll aerate our soil because it's a little bit thicker, a little bit chunkier, um, and so it'll break apart a thick soil. Um, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a looser soil, like a, a sandy soil, it'll add more girth to it. It'll add a thicker element to it as well and help hold in moisture. Um, so the benefits of compost go on and on and on about using it. And of course, obviously, the nutrients. It provides a lot of nutrients to your soil. Um, so that's why we want to compost, and that's why we want to use compost. Um, it also is a, so it's a natural fertilizer, so you can use it as a natural fertilizer. Um, it, um, and, and of course, the environmental benefits of doing our own composting is hugely beneficial to our landfills. Um, and so studies have shown that if you uh, compost everything that you can compost, it would eliminate about 30% of your waste and about 30% of what we would put into our landfills. So if everybody was composting, we could decrease what we are putting in our landfills by 30%, which is a huge number. Um, so, you know, landfills, they just put it in a pile, um, and, and unfortunately that's just how they have to do it. And of course it releases methane gases, which we know are not great for the environment. So by doing our own composting and turning it and doing all the different things that I'll talk about today, um, we can eliminate what we're putting into the landfills, and that's extremely important. Um, so that's why we want to continue to compost. Uh, because it really helps our landfills and of course it's great for our plants and our vegetables and our herbs and anything we might be growing. Um, it's, a, it's a great product. Um, so if you are just interested in learning about compost and then maybe at the end of this you say, well, maybe I don't want to do composting myself, that's okay. You can buy compost. Um, if, if you're in the area, if you live in the Hampton Roads area here, we sell lots of different types of compost. We sell our McDonald compost, our own brand of compost, which is a bit of a thicker compost. It's more from um, a bark-based material. Um, it's got a little bit of peat in it, but it's a little bit chunkier. It's all natural. It's completely organic, completely safe for any use. Um, so that's a really, really good one. Uh, we've got a McGill compost, which is a locally sourced compost. And that one's really cool because it's kind of a complete cycle. Um, it uses food waste and byproducts. It, it also uses a little bit of sludge. Um, which is a little bit of you and me is what I always tell people, but it's a great compost, very, very strong, very rich. Um, and so, so that's a great compost. 
Sometimes I might not recommend it if you're using it for, um, for vegetable gardening, but you can use it. It's completely safe. It's been tested. It's, it's a very safe product. Uh, we also sell cow manure compost, and I think anybody can probably get cow manure compost across the United States. Uh, mushroom compost has become very popular as well. So mushroom compost you can buy already done in a bag. Um, mushroom compost is basically the growing media that they use to grow mushrooms, and they can only use it uh, for one or two crop cycles or maybe three cycles, and then they've got to get rid of it. So it's a great, really rich, really fine material usually. Um, so mushroom compost is a very good one. Um, and then, of course, we have a new one this year, Espoma Land and Sea Compost, which is great. That's got some chicken manure in it as well as lobster and crab shells. So, uh, so another kind of great formula. So if you ever need compost, and your compost pile might, might not be ready yet, um, then of course you can always buy compost. And there's lots and lots of different uh, choices out there. Um, and compost is super important, as I mentioned before. So make sure to use compost if you need it, you can always buy it. Um, today we're gonna focus on three key things that I really want uh, to, to kind of stress and, and make very important um, is, is the types of composters that you can use. So we're gonna start there and talk about the different types of composters. Um, I'm also going to talk about the ingredients, what goes into a good compost, and that's probably the most important thing. And then I'm going to do some do's and don'ts, uh, some of the things that, that some of the tips and tricks um, that will help you with your composting and making sure that you have a very good, rich compost, um, and that will help you kind of finish up the process. And then I'll open it up for questions, so that way, if you have a lot of specific questions, we can get to those. Um, so let's start off with the types of composters. Lots of different types of composters out there. Uh, too many to even list. Uh, but we'll try and keep it very simple and compact here. And we'll start with tumbling composters. I think a lot of us know about tumbling composters. Usually it's a barrel turned on the side. It's got a base or a stand. It might have a base on the ground. But basically the idea behind a tumbling composter is it's an enclosed environment. It's going to help keep the heat in there. Um, it's going to be probably one of the most efficient ways of composting. So it's a very quick way of composting. It's a very easy way of composting. Uh, the, the, the idea of a tumbling composter is that it's easy to turn. So if you've got back problems or uh, maybe you just don't want to turn your compost as much, a turning composter, a tumbling composter is very easy to use. You put your materials in it and you just turn it every so often. You can turn it every day, you can turn it once or twice a week. Um, it's kind of up to you and how fast you want your compost to, to form. Um, the downfall of tumbling composters is they're not very big. They're not going to hold a lot. So if you live in, a, in an urban environment where you don't have a lot of space, a tumbling composter might be right for you, might be a good fit for you. Um, but, uh, but it's not going to do as much as a compost pile might do. Um, so if we've got space, we'll talk about composting piles probably the most. But tumbling composters are a great option. Now you can actually make your own tumbling composter, you can make your own bin composter. So let me get to that in a minute because I'll talk about that uh, when we get to the, the compost bins. Uh, vermicomposting is another great option. Uh, we actually got into a great uh, uh, tumbleweed is this company. Um, you can buy these online, you can buy them here at our McDonald Garden Center. But tumbleweed is the name. They make a Worm composter, this is called can of worms and you can see it's pretty big. It's got these layers to it, so it's really kind of a cool system, but anything that uses worms is called vermicomposting. So vermicomposting is using worms to do your composting for you. So um, worms obviously are great, they're great for the environment, they're great for your soil, and they're great for composting because they can break down material very quickly. So again, if you're in a small urban environment, you can actually do these indoors, it keeps the smell down very well. Um, so you can do it on a, on a covered porch or a deck or a, a patio. Uh, so Can of Worms by Tumbleweed, they also have the Worm Cafe um, is a great option. Or I'm going to show you another one that's really, really cool here in, in a second. Um, but vermicomposting, the idea is using the worms to help compost. And red wigglers are probably one of the best worms to use. Now, any worms will do it. Um, you might have natural worms in your yard. Uh, but red wigglers, you can pretty much get anywhere. You can buy them online. You can buy them probably at your bait and tackle store. Um, very easy to come by. If you're local and you need to get uh, red wigglers and you can't find them, let us know. We don't carry them in stock, but I can get them. Um, but uh, red wigglers are a great way of, of using worms to compost. Uh, but all worms can do it. And so that's what brings me to my next topic, which is this worm feast. So this, again, is by Tumbleweed. This is called a worm feast, and this is a really cool little product. 
very easy to use. Uh, so basically what this is in this box, I'll kind of show you the box here real quick. But basically what's in it is this. This is the composter. So what you do is you bury this. So you actually bury this in the ground. So you just bury it like a plant. So you're just going to put it down on the ground really level. These are great for raised beds when the soil is nice and light and easy to use. But you can use it anywhere around the home. If you're doing vegetable gardening in the ground, if you're doing it in raised beds, this is a great option. But basically what you're going to do is bury this in the ground. You're going to put soil around it on the outside. Leave the inside hollow. And then you just take your top off. And you can put your food scraps in here. The worms are going to come in through the, these holes in the side and through the little vents and they're going to go in, take the nutrients, take what they want out of the food scraps and then take it with them and go back out. And the, what they're doing is they're spreading those nutrients. They're going to decompose that, that organic matter and they're going to spread it around in your soil which is really kind of a cool way of composting. So this is a great option. Uh, like I said, for raised beds, for vegetable gardens, for anywhere around the yard. Uh, and it kind of keeps your composting out of sight, keeps it down low. Again, I'll show you that picture so you can kind of see the idea once it's in the ground. See if you can see that. So right down there, you can see he's just putting, they're just putting the food scraps right into that open hole. And that's how you do it. And so this is a great option for something small. Um, and that's a great way of doing vermicomposting right in the ground. It's a really awesome option. So tumbling composters, vermicomposting is another option. Uh, compost bins. Um, so I, I don't sell a lot of compost bins. I don't have any in stock right now. But you can buy them all online and that's kind of tumbling composters, uh, compost bins. You can see there's a lot of resources out on the internet uh, to be able to get those. Um, they can become very expensive. And so let me tell you how you can make your own. Um, one option is just to take a big heavy duty trash can. Drill a half inch hole, about four inches apart, all the way around the trash can. Take some time, but just drill some holes with plastic so you should be able to rip right through it real quickly. Drill a bunch of holes all over it. And then you can put your compost right in there. And if you can get a good lid that fits on there tightly, you can actually turn it into, into a tumbling composter by just laying it down on its side and rolling it. If you want to add a little bit of, uh, of an extra item into that, take a piece of two inch wood and bolt it to the inside so you've got a few strips of wood, three strips of wood on the inside will help kind of tumble it a little bit more. It helps break it apart. So if you start to get chunks of different things in there, it'll help break it apart really well. Uh, so you can actually build your own composting bin. You can, help, you can also build your own tumbling composter in that same kind of way. Uh, so hopefully that helps if that's an option that you want to do. Um, and of course I'm going to talk about compost piles probably the most. So uh, compost bins are again typically a plastic bin. Sometimes they have bottoms to them that you can pull the compost out. So you put your compost in the top. You need to put it in, in the correct layers. We'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but you would, you would need to kind of follow the directions there. That would be like a no turning compost where you can actually pull a drawer out on the bottom and get the compost out. Um, there also are compost bins that just go directly on top of the soil, which are also a great option. What that will do is actually as it gets moist, it will it'll form a compost tea that will work its way down into the soil and, and fertilize and, and, and add a lot of nutrients to the soil under, uh, underneath. Um, and then you can move it to another location. So that's an option. Some people will build that just out of chicken wire or just a wire fence. Uh, you can build it, you can put your compost in there. Usually the smaller the hole, the easier it is to put more compost in. And then once you've really decomposed it enough, you can move it to another location if you want to. And then that way that soil under there is very good. Or you can keep it in the same spot. So again, lots and lots of options. Uh, compost piles, I think, are probably what most people are trying to do. Uh, which is usually just a pile. And that's what I do and that's what I think a lot of people do. If you've got the space, if you've got an area um, that you can start a compost pile, it's very simple. You don't have to spend any money at all. Um, you don't have to build a container system for it. If you want to, you can. Um, a lot of people do. You can use, um, you can use um, uh, wood to, to build a frame, basically something to enclose the sides and the back. You usually want to keep the front open so you can get in there and work it. Um, and, and some people will build tops on them, but you don't have to. You definitely don't need to. 
Um, you can also use cinder block just to enclose it, or you can use that inexpensive wire metal fencing, uh, 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 erosion control fencing, beach fencing. There's a lot of different names for it. Uh, there's lots of different ways of enclosing it if you feel you need to, if you feel you need to have that, that ability to enclose it a little bit. You would only enclose it on three sides. So you would typically do the sides and the back, leave the front open uh, so that you can get in there and get your compost out. Um, but you don't have to. And that's kind of, I think, the most important thing about composting. If you want to start composting today, you can because you don't have to have anything. All you really need to have is bare ground. So for a compost pile, all I really want you to do is have bare ground to start putting your stuff on. So that's what we're going to talk about mostly is compost piles. But all of what I'm going to talk about here going on, go, going on from, from here um, as I get into like the ingredients of what makes a good compost you can use, use that information for all of these, whether you're usually a, a tumbling composter, a vermicomposter, composting bins, or just a pile. The rest of this information applies to all of that. Um, but I think compost piles are what most of us are probably trying to do at home. We're trying to, to, to form a compost in the most efficient and economical way, and compost piles are a great option. So if you've got space, that's a great option for you. Um, so let's talk, let's move on to the next topic. So now we've got all the different types of composters out of the way. There's lots of them out there. You can use any of them. They're all great options. There's nothing wrong with any of them. If you want to do a compost pile, of course, you can start that right now today. Um, and, and that's a great option because it's just a pile. It's easy to use. All right. So composting ingredients. This is very, very important. This is probably the most important part of composting is what do you put in your compost pile? Um, so there's two different ingredients, really. There's two different, two different segments of ingredients. One is carbon-rich ingredients, and the other one is nitrogen-rich ingredients. Um, so what are those? I usually say, to, to keep it kind of easy, carbon-rich is going to be your brown material. Nitrogen-rich is going to be your green material. So let's go through a, a little bit of the list of, of what those are. Carbon rich. Let's start with carbon rich. There's a lot of them out there, although this is going to be one of the hardest things I think it is for most people to, to get is the carbon rich uh, materials, your brown materials. So we've got branches, stems, dried leaves. So dried leaves are in the fall when the leaves fall off the trees. Dried leaves are great. Peels, bits of wood, bark, sawdust, shredded paper bags are a great option. Coffee filters, coffee grounds. I know a lot of us use K-cups these days. <laughs> so, uh, so they make these reusable K-cups. Great option. You can take the coffee grounds and use those. It's a great brown material. And then we don't have the plastic waste. Um, so, so coffee grounds, coffee filters, pine needles are another great option. Any conifer needle. So if you've got evergreens around the, the yard and they're dropping brown material, brown needles, then you can use those. Great product. Uh, Eggshells. Straw, if you have straw left over from fall decorating, or you're using, uh, if you're doing hay bale uh, uh, gardening, then you've got that great straw to use. You can also buy straw because it's inexpensive to add a brown material. So straw is another good one. Peat moss is a great one, obviously. You would have to purchase that most likely, uh, but peat moss would be a great additive. Um, let's see, what else I got on my list? Oh, wood ash. So wood ash is a good one. So if you're burning wood, if you've got an outdoor fire pit, that ash is great. If you've got a fireplace that you're burning real wood in, then ash, wood ash is a great option. So wood ash is another one. Um, again, anything that's going to kind of help. And, and think about these as things that are going to kind of absorb some moisture. Um, that's what we're talking about with brown material. Shredded paper. If you want to use shredded paper, shredded paper, pa paper is a great option. Um, just don't use ones that are really glossy, so don't use a glossy, a high gloss paper. Um, and don't use anything with a lot of colored ink on it. Um, newspaper works really well too. Don't use the comics maybe, but the rest of the paper really should work fine. Um, but again, trying to avoid that colored ink. Um, but any, you know, typically your weekly newspapers, your Monday through Saturdays aren't going to have a lot of colored ink in it, but newspaper works great. And of course, cardboard. I think probably right now most of us have a lot of cardboard. <laughs> We've been receiving boxes and boxes and boxes of stuff 
uh, whether it's from Amazon or different websites uh, because we've been stuck at home. So uh, cardboard is a great option. Now, of course, we want to shred that. So, of course, you're going to want to probably, I, I find the best way is just to leave it outside, leave a cardboard box outside, flatten it down, let the rain water or just water it. Then you can get in there and shred it pretty easily um, instead of having to sit there with a pair of scissors or a, a knife or something and cut it all up. But cardboard is a great option. Again, trying to avoid anything with gloss, waxy cardboards aren't going to break down very well. And um, colored inks. We just want to avoid a lot of colored inks. But all of those are kind of carbon-rich materials. Those are going to be your brown material. And that's what's very, very important. Now, the next part, the, the, the other one, is nitrogen-rich. Nitrogen-rich material, the green material. That's going to be your food scraps, your, you know, your vegetable scraps, your fruit scraps. Um, it's going to be grass clippings, which I think a lot of us have is grass clippings, and that's what we start our compost piles with. Um, it's also going to be kitchen waste, so any kind of kitchen waste that, you're, that you might be using. So leftover food scraps that you might be throwing into the trash cran, you can use those. Um, and I'll, again, I'll get into the list of what, what you can and cannot use. Um, uh, but green leaves are another one, so any kind of green leaf material. Those are going to be your nitrogen rich materials. Those are going to be your green materials. So plants, so again, what we're talking about plants, we're talking about pruning stuff. Um, so I, I see a question, raw food scraps, can we use cooked food scraps? Yes. Um, so you can use cooked, you can use raw. What you don't want to do, I'll talk about this in my don'ts, but I think it's kind of important to bring that up now, is a lot of us don't, we don't want to recommend using meat or bones um, in, our, in our compost bins, especially in a compost pile. So if we're doing a compost pile and you use meat or bones, then that's going to encourage pests. You're going to start to get mice, you're going to start to get raccoons, you're going to start to get lots of different animals, pests, it's going to smell. Um, so we're going to try to avoid meat and bones in our compost piles. Now, if you've got a, com a tumbling compost, you can actually compost these. Um, a lot of people don't recommend it. You don't have to do it. Um, by all means, you can throw them away. Um, but if you do want to compost them and you've got an enclosed container to compost them, you can. Now, that's a very green material. That's going to release a lot of moisture. It's going to release a, a lot of smell. And so then we want to use um, um, a lot of brown material to help absorb some of that moisture. I see a question about black ink on, car on cardboard. Not super harmful. Again, we don't want to use anything that's completely coated in a ton of, you know, big, big, huge logos all over the package. It's probably not the best. Um, but cardboard is, is one of the best options and something that I think a lot of us have right now. So um, again, kind of using those um, and just it's personal preference again. So a lot of different personal preferences here um, as to what you might want to use. Um, and we'll talk about this again as we get it kind of into the do's and the don'ts of what to use and what not to use. Um, but those are going to be your green. Now, let, this is a, again important that we know the, the ingredients. We've got our brown material, we've got our green material. Our carbon based, our high carbon rich uh, uh, materials are going to be your branches, your dry leaves, um, your straw, your pine straw, your, your conifer needles, um, your paper products, anything of those, those brown bags, um, anything like that, those are going to be great brown materials, uh, carbon rich materials. A lot of people I think are going to struggle trying to get enough of those. But if you've got trees in the area, leaves are going to be great. I'll give you a tip on how to deal with that later. Um, so then the nitrogen rich is probably what we're going to have the most of. I think a lot of us bag our leaf, our, our lawn clippings, which is a great way of, of, of getting a good source of material. We also are going to have lots of food waste. So we're going to have lots of uh, uh, eggshell, well sorry, eggshells is carbon rich, but we're going to have a lot of, you know, we're, we're using like the, the peels off of cucumbers. We're using um, any of our leftover food scraps that are not meat based. Um, so a lot of those things are going to go into the compost pile and those are, are going to create a lot of nitrogen, um, which is why we call them our nitrogen rich materials. Uh, and they're going to release a lot of moisture and that's why we have to have an even ratio. So no, I say that shouldn't be an even ratio. What we really want and this is another important, important part of this, is we want two-thirds to be carbon rich. So we want two-thirds brown material. And then we want one-third green material. It's typically a good ratio. 
So if we're, if we're putting in grass clippings, and let's say we, we've mowed our grass and we've got three or four bagfuls, uh, or you know the, the lawnmower bags, we've got three or four loads of green material. That's green material. That is, that is nitrogen rich. So we've got to have five to six, seven, eight bags of brown material to add with that. So that, that carbon rich material to, to be able to help that ratio stay very, very even. Um, and when I say even, I keep saying that, but what I mean is one third green material, two thirds brown material. So really, really important that we kind of try and keep that ratio the, the best as possible. Um, and I think that's probably one of the most important things that you can know is that whether it's a green material or a brown material, um, and, and trying to source that carbon rich is probably the hardest is probably the hardest thing for people to get their hands on is a carbon rich material. Um, but we'll talk about a little bit of that as we kind of go on. So those are really your two compost ingredients: are the green material and the brown material, nitrogen based, nitrogen rich, and then carbon rich. So we've got those two things, and we want two thirds carbon brown material, one third green material. So Keep that in mind as we continue to go on. So now I'll give you some kind of tips and tricks and some do's and don'ts. Let's start with the don'ts. Let's start with what we don't want to use. Uh, we don't, again, we don't want to use meat or bones in compost piles if we can avoid it, um, especially in compost piles. Again, if you're using an enclosed um, tumbling composter, um, a compost bin, um, those are options that you can use to decompose meat or uh, bones, uh, but again, it's going to add a smell to it. It's going to add the, the ability for uh, 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 natural wildlife to, to get really excited to try and get in there um, and, and, and try and, and, and get to it. Um, so, so think about those things. Might be better just to kind of eliminate those um, and just put those into the into the into the trash can. Um, so, I typically don't recommend using meat or bones. Um, don't use diseased plants, so that's a very important one. If we're pruning, if we're, let's say we're doing a vegetable garden and we unfortunately get a diseased tomato or pepper plant, um, and you pull that plant out because there's no cure for it, throw it in a trash can, don't put it in your compost pile. That can spread disease, almost, almost a majority of those diseases are soil-borne diseases. And so we don't want to encourage that into a soil that we might be using in our vegetable gardens. Um, and, and just a good kind of uh, a thing to always think about is if, if you've got a diseased plant and you're doing trimming on it uh, to, uh, to uh, open it up to spray it with a fungicide or a disease control, um, or you've lost some pepper plants or tomato plants or whatever it may be due to a disease, don't use those plants in your compost pile. You're better off just throwing those away and using other organic matter, um, uh, other clippings. So don't use diseased plants. Um, don't use your grass clippings if you have sprayed recently a herbicide on them. So if you sprayed a herbicide in the, in the past two weeks, um, typically those grass clippings are still going to have that herbicide and don't use those. Uh, just dispose of those this time and then the next time you'll be fine. If you want to wait one to two weeks, you're usually in the clear. So just make sure you're kind of thinking about that. That's a really good one to really ask us questions on. Uh, there's some insecticides too that you want to be careful about. Um, so insecticides. Um, uh, there are some systemic insecticides that last in the system of the plant for a while. So if you use a systemic insecticide on your lawn and then you're using your grass clippings in your compost pile, that may be an issue. It also depends on how quickly we're going to get our compost going and we'll talk about that again uh, a little bit more as we go along. Um, but composting can take some time. So if, if, you're, if you're probably taking somewhere between five and six months to get your compost pile really activated and going into the point where you're using compost, which most of us I think are probably in that range, um, then most of that stuff is going to work its way out and we'll talk about that again as we get into what you want to do to increase your compostability. Uh, don't use pet manure um, or human manure <laughs> um, or any kind of other animal manure um, in, in your home composting. I don't recommend it. Um, again, it's most likely because you're taking some sort, of, you, you might be giving your, your animals flea or tick control, um, you, might be, you might be taking pharmaceuticals yourself, um, if you've got chickens or any of those other uh, um, uh, animals around your home or, um, that you might be raising, then we don't know what you're giving them if you're giving them any kind of, of medicines and that's why we don't use manure typically. Also again, we're dealing with smell issues at that point. 
Um, if, you, if, you, if you're not giving them anything and you want to use it, or they really are great options to use in your compost pile if you're not going to be using this compost on any food related products. Um, so if you're using it in the lawn or garden, then yeah, use the manure. It's a great option. Your pet manure is perfectly fine if you want to use that. But I don't recommend it if you're using it for growing vegetables. It would be my personal opinion. Again, always better safe than sorry. So um, think about those things um, as you're doing it. And again, it's personal preference. It's all up to you. We're just giving you kind of the, the sound kind of, again, this is composting 101. So I just want to give you some basic information on how you can, on how you can compost in your, um, around your home. Um, so those are some of the things that we don't want to use um, in our compost piles. What we do want to do to our compost piles, so we, we know a lot of the good materials that we can put into our compost pile. Um, and what those are, of course, are yard waste. Yard waste is one of the biggest things that fills up our landfills, especially right now we're all at home working in our yards, um, and so we've got lots of projects in mind, and so we've got lots of yard waste. Um, and you don't need to go and buy um, a chipper or a wood chipper or anything like that. We'll talk about kind of some, some examples of those, and I'll probably get to those when we get to the questions. Um, but we don't want it, we, we want to be, if we can, if we can compost our uh, yard materials, then that saves the landfill a lot. And then your food scraps are going to be that third, that, that nitrogen rich. And then our yard waste typically is going to be, other than grass clippings that are green, most of our yard waste is going to be uh, in that carbon rich. And that's what's really, really good is, is those branches, those stems, we're trimming shrubs, we're trimming branches, dead branches that fall off of our trees. Uh, these are all great options of carbon rich material to put into our compost piles. Um, so, so, those are, so that's what we want to use is our yard waste and that's what we really want to try and encourage to, to use up in our, in our composting. Um, so one way to speed up the compost pro process, let's say we have a compost pile started. Um, well, let me start here. Compost piles, if we're doing a compost pile, again, we want bare ground. The first layer of your compost pile should be a carbon-based material. So branches are great, cut up. Um, you don't have to cut them up super, super small, but just branches on the ground, straw, pine needles, any of those things, dry leaves, great base layer to start with. And then your green can go on that. And we typically want to encourage doing layers. And so we always want to put that layer of green material and then a layer of carbon over top of it. We typically don't want our green layers on top. And why don't we want that is because they typically, as they break down, they're nitrogen-based materials. Our green materials are nitrogen-based. And they're going to usually release a smell. Um, they're also going to encourage um, wildlife into the area. Um, of course, raccoons and, and, and mice will eat different things. So yes, you may have them and they may come anyways. Uh, think of it kind of as a recycling program. Um, if, if they're digging through it, that's okay. They're helping turn it a little bit for you. Uh, again, then you might start thinking about enclosing it or covering it, and I'll talk about those in a minute. Um, but we typically want to do layers. And so if we're just doing a compost pile, start with a carbon-based material first. Then add your green, then add carbon, then add green, then add carbon, and keep that process so you got good layering going on. Um, so dried leaves. Dried leaves are probably one of the most, uh, the, the best source of, of carbon that you can get of that, that brown material. Um, but typically you have so many of them, so you don't have to put them all on the compost pile at first. What I usually do is have a pile of, of dried up leaves off to the side that I can add. So when I add a green material, when I add a nitrogen-based material, I can add my carbon dried up fall leaves to it. And that pile can sit there for a while and that will decompose by itself. Just leaves by themselves will decompose, become finer. That way you don't have to shred them or worry about any of that. They, become, they start to decompose by themselves in a pile and then you can add that material. So it's a great option of having kind of two separate little piles, one for your leaves and then one to start your compost pile and then adding that brown material to your green material. So having some dried up leaves stored off to the side is a great way of always having that carbon based, uh, that, that brown material available to you to apply when you, when you add some green material. Char chopping larger pieces into smaller pieces, that really does help, whether we're talking about food or not. So if you've got some carrots that have gone bad and you want to put that into your, to your, to your pile, chopping them up will help. Again, chopping up anything will help. Uh, make it decompose even faster. 
So, um, so anytime you can chop up anything, of course, branches. Uh, we typically, you know, aren't going to want to add any branches that are that are super super thick because again, that's going to that's going to put a lot more work on you uh, to decompose those. If you again can set them off to the side, let them decompose a little bit, then they're a lot easier to break up into smaller pieces. Um, if we're doing branches or if we're doing clippings off of a shrub, you're typically dealing with smaller pieces. If you've got a branch that, that fell off the tree, cut up the smaller pieces. The big chunks leave off to the side, they'll decompose a little bit, they'll be much easier to break up and put smaller pieces in there. Again, I, I don't want, I'm trying to keep this as simple as possible so you don't have to go and invest thousands of dollars into wood chippers and all these different things. Again, if you've got a wood chipper, great. You can chip up your wood. Um, if, if you've had somebody, if you've had a tree cut down and you've got wood clippings, wood shreds from the stump grindings or from, from shredding up the, the branches and the leaves, um, then that's a great brown material. That's a great source of brown material. Trying to avoid you having to purchase a lot of different things here. Um, so let's see what else. Um, water. So water is important in this. If you're going through a very dry period, if we're going through the summer months and your pile seems very, very, um, uh, very dry and it doesn't seem to be holding a lot of moisture, adding water will help. Now, if you've got your pile out in a natural setting, then you're typically going to get rainwater, especially in the spring and fall. In the summer, obviously, we may not get as much water. Uh, it depends on where you live. Um, but water does help. So if, you're, if your compost pile begins to turn a little bit dry on you, adding water is okay. Even in tumbling composters, bin composters, especially if they're covered up, they're not getting rain. Um, so we want to add a little bit of water if we need to, if we got a drier formula. Now, if it's, if it's a dry formula and you've got some green scraps that you can put in there, anything nitrogen based is going to release moisture. So think about that too. Okay, I, I need, it seems a little dry. I need to add something. I need to add some water, but I'm about to mow my grass. Then you've got a green nitrogen rich, uh, moisture rich source that you're about to put into your compost pile. Think about that too. Add that. That'll add some moisture to it. If it's too soggy, if, if it's gotten really, really wet, then we need to let it dry out. A couple different ways to do that. You can cover. So if you've got a pile, if you've got a compost pile, then you want to cover it. Use a tarp. I always have a, a, a tarp handy, a good tarp with no holes in it. Um, and then that way you can cover your pile. So if we're going through a really wet period and you've got your compost pile, you can throw a tarp over it. That will help. Not only will it keep the heat in, which is good, especially when we get into the winter months, um, but keeping the heat in will help, but it also will keep excess moisture from rain out. So if, if it's, oh man, it's going to rain for the next two weeks, we can cover our compost pile. Now, if you're dealing with a, with a tumbling composter or a bin composter, something that's covered, um, then you don't need to worry about covering it. Uh, but that's just for, for a compost pile. Um, and, and so, again, back to that soggy condition. If we're, if we're soggy in a covered bin, if we're soggy in a tumbling composter, we need more carbon-rich material. we got to start looking for some paper products. We gotta start looking for some branch material. We gotta look for something that can absorb that moisture. Bark. Sometimes it might get to the extreme where you need to go buy something to help absorb that. And then you might need to go buy a soil. Throwing compost into a compost pile is not a bad option. Uh, it does help thicken up your material. Um, peat moss is a great option to help absorb some of that moisture. So you, you might eventually have to do that. Straw is a great option. Go buy a bale of, of wheat straw or pine straw. Great option to throw in there to thicken up your mixture and help absorb some moisture. That's probably what we're always kind of trying to do is, is, is get between that, get, that, get that perfect ratio of brown material to green material and keeping it less soggy or more wet. So we're constantly kind of playing with it, and that's probably the best advice that I'll give you um, here at the end is, is it's trial and error to some degree. We're always trying to find that perfect even ratio. Um, steam. If you're seeing steam come off your pile, that's a good sign. That means it's heating up. That's a good, good sign. So that doesn't mean anything bad. Um, if it smells, let's talk about smells. Um, compost can smell sometimes. Um, it should have a good, earthy, rich kind of garden smell. But if it doesn't, if it's got a bad smell, you usually are going to need more carbon-based material. Now, another option is you can use lime. Lime works, you can use a limestone, you can use a powdered lime, you can actually use calcium too, so calcium and lime cover up smells. They're actually not a bad idea for compost. This is Magical, so Magical is straight calcium, it's a great option 
to, to kind of eliminate some of those odors. You just work this in, you spread it over the top surface, work it in as you turn it. Um, great option is Magical. Um, and then of course, this doesn't help with smell, but I saw it down there, I haven't mentioned it yet. If you need to get your compost started a little bit faster, this is made by Natural Guard Compost Maker. Espoma makes a compost maker as well, a compost accelerator. Um, and basically what this is gonna do is help kind of break down that, that compost a little bit faster. Um, and then the last thing I will show you, or one of the last things I'll show you, is if you've got way too much brown material, which is probably very rare, I don't think a lot of us are gonna be in the situation where we don't have grass clippings to add in, we don't have a lot of green material to add in, and we've got a lot of brown material. But let's say you're just composting leaves, um, or um, any, uh, you've just got an excess of carbon or brown material. Nitrate of soda is a good option. Uh, this is made by high yield. Again, it's just nitrogen. So if you look at the numbers on the back, it's just 1600. So it's just straight nitrogen. Um, it is on organic nitrogen. But basically what that's gonna do is it's gonna replace your green material. Green material is nitrogen based. It's gonna be releasing a lot of nitrogen. It's gonna get the compost activated and moving. That's what this will do. So if you've ever done straw bale gardening, hay bale gardening, you know that nitrate of soda or nitrogen is one of the first steps because you have to decompose that straw on the inside so you're gonna add a lot of nitrogen to help break down that brown material. So if you got an excess of brown material, this might be a great option. So those are kind of some products there that I'll just show you real quick. Um, again, just to kind of help move your composting along. All right, so then the last thing I'm gonna talk about is probably the most important thing along with getting your ingredients right is turning your compost. You gotta turn it. You gotta move it. That's aeration is key here. The compost is gonna heat up so much on the inside that it'll kill a lot of these things off, any of the bad stuff, but it's also gonna encourage the composting process. It's gonna encourage the microorganisms uh, to come up. Uh, if you're doing a compost pile, it's gonna encourage earthworms. They love warmth. So they're gonna be encouraged to kind of work into that area. But that heat source is going to stay in the center and if we're not turning it then the outside is going to stay cool it's never going to decompose and the inside is going to decompose very quickly and we're never going to get to it so we got to keep turning it i know it's a process and i know it's painful how much do you turn it it's really up to you and how fast you want compost i typically try and turn mine once a week uh, so once a week i usually go out there and i'm almost always putting stuff in it once a week um, so that, that's something that to think about is as you put something in it, great time to go get your pitchfork. Uh, pitchforks work. You can also use something like this, like a, a hoe or a, a tined rake, anything that you can kind of get in there and just work it. Shovels, you know, work as well. So get your shovel and get in there and just turn it. You just got to turn it. It's probably the, the number one step that I think most people don't do enough is turning your compost pile. You just have to do it. Airflow is needed to encourage this process. So we got to get air in there. We got to get oxygen in there. We got to release some of the other uh, the the batter uh, or, or the um, the um, release of the carbon dioxide and, and the methane gas and stuff like that that can build up if we let it sit too long. And we don't want to encourage that. So what we want to do that's again that's what the landfill is doing is they're just putting it in a pile and letting it decompose. If we can turn it, we're going to get compost faster, and it's going to help not build up those methane gases. So of course, turning it is super, super important. We gotta do it, it also will help you see it. It'll help you see the material. What stage are we in? Do I need more carbon rich? Do I need more nitrogen rich material? What do I need to add? So we're constantly turning it. Again, tumbling composters are gonna give you the ability to see it, and, and it's gonna give you the ability to turn it much faster. Bin composters are usually a no-turn system, typically. Uh, No-turn systems work as well. You got to get your ingredients right. You got to get it kind of fine-tuned in there. Every time we add one part nitrogen-based, we want to add two parts of carbon-based. So kind of think about those. Read your directions on your bin composters. Make sure you're doing that appropriately and correctly. Uh, if you ever feel like you've messed up and you feel like you need to start over when you're in a confined composter, then start over. So if you're in a bin composter, dump it out, look at your material, put it back in and then we can start over, and that way you can kind of see it. Uh, but turning your compost, especially when we're doing piles, uh, compost piles, compost bins, you gotta turn it, you gotta keep it moving, you gotta keep the air going, and you gotta keep that heat going. 
Weed seeds, I think, are another common issue that a lot of people have issues with. Um, if you're mowing your grass and you've got a natural lawn or you've got a lot of weeds and you get weed seeds in there, weed seeds can be a problem with compost for sure. When we put our compost down, if it never got to a temperature to kill a weed seed, we got to be at 140 degrees for a month. So that's, that's tough. That's a tough, that's a tall order. So weed seeds can become a problem. Again, turning your compost is going to eliminate a, a major source of that. Turning will get those weed seeds worked into the, side, into the inside of the compost. The more we turn it, the better off we'll be. If you do have weed seed issues, then stop putting weed seeds in there. It's the best advice I can give you. If you've got a lot of lawn clippings, and, and that's, what you're, that's what you're using for your nitrogen-based material for your compost pile, then, and you've got weeds, weeds seed at a very early age. So weeds are going to put out seeds very quickly, and they're going to end up in your green clippings. And then you're going to put them into your compost pile, and if we're not getting the heat that we need, then that can become a problem. So again, making sure that we're turning our piles will really, really help with the weed seeds. If you, if you ever use your compost and you get some crazy weeds growing, then that means that we're not getting hot enough. And so we either need to try and encourage more heat, which means we've got to get our ratios right, we've got to get our ratio back to the, to, the, to the right base, or we need to let our compost sit longer to decompose more, to become a finer material. So let's, let's make sure that we're doing that. Um, so, so weed seeds can become a problem if you're finding that you've got a lot of weed seed issues, um, then, then we need to try and eliminate putting them in there is the best advice I can give you. Um, now, weed seeds can blow in. If you put down your compost in your garden and a weed seed blows into it, of course it's going to grow great. It's a great soil. You've created this amazing soil and so of course the weed is going to germinate and love it. But if you're putting it down and you're getting a lot of weeds growing, then that typically means we're not getting hot enough and we need to try and encourage that. The compost maker will help. The compost maker will help encourage the compost to heat up a little bit more and to decompose a little bit faster. So that might be a good option for you as well. Um, but we would need to make sure that our ratios are right. And that, again, that's kind of one, one of the tips that I always give whenever I talk about composting, trial and error. These things, you're, you're going to learn some things, you're going to fail, you're going to succeed, it's going to be a process. Again, the eye is one of your best judgments here. You can use your hand as well. Um, you can put your hand into the compost pile, um, or you can put a plastic bag over your hand and put, your, put it into the compost pile if you're a little worried. Um, but that will tell you the temperature. It should be hot enough that it's a little uncomfortable for your hand to be in there. That's how hot we should be getting. So we're looking at to, trying to get to 140, 150 degrees. Um, so that's super, super important. A um, couple other things that I want to touch on before I open it up to the questions um, is pH. I think pH is super important. Um, and, and so knowing the pH of your compost is very helpful. Um, I know we've got people watching all over the country. Most of your local garden centers should do free pH tests. If not, you can get a couple different things. So you can buy these online or you can buy them here at the garden center. This is a rapid test. This is just a pH test. So you actually get, I think, uh, 10 tests in this one. Yep, so you can do 10 tests. It gets you pretty close, so that's a good option. We also have another one that does a little bit more. This one does nitrogen, phosphorus, potassium, and pH. So again, you've got 40 tests, 10 in each one, but this will also give you a pH. And then, of course, one of my favorite tools is the pH meter. So this is a great one. This is a three-in-one meter. This one does pH, light, and moisture. So this could be really beneficial for our compost people. Um, so if you're composting, it'll tell you if you're way too wet, way too dry. So it'll tell you your moisture level. It'll also tell you your pH and get you close to what your pH might be. But again, we can do a very, very specific pH. We can get very, very close. And what I just want you to know about pH is, is most likely it's going to be pretty acidic. Um, and, and why is that? Um, and I'm talking specifically about the Hampton Roads area here in Virginia. Depends on, on where you are. Uh, you know, I know Pennsylvania, we have somebody watching in Pennsylvania, Maryland. You might have more alkaline soil, and that's because of the different types of plants that grow up there. Create an alkaline condition. Here, we have pines, maples, oaks. Those are all going to make acidic soil. And so if we're using those leaves, we're going to have acidic soil. And that's why applying lime is a great option. So we've got our dolomitic lime here, sorry, dolomitic lime, so lime will, won't, will also help with your smells, but will also help control your pH a little bit. Uh, Magical is calcium, it's going to bring your pH up a little bit faster, uh, but this is a great option as well. So Magical will bring your pH up. 
checking your pH is probably the best way to know. So, um, so, so using a meter, using your pH testers will help. We have a one that's a little bit more specific here, gets you a little bit fine-tuned, gets you, you know, a little bit more accurate. Um, of course, none of those testers are 100% accurate. They're not great, uh, but they'll get you kind of close. And that's kind of what the most important thing is. And what I want you to know about pH is, is if your pH is way out of whack, if our compost becomes way too high or way too low on the pH scale, we can correct that. Um, if it gets too high, so for people in Pennsylvania, uh, you probably know uh, soil acidifiers really well, um, which is sulfur. Um, so, so you're adding, or sorry, um, sulfate, so aluminum sulfate or just sulfur um, will bring your pH down. Um, and we might need to do that. If your compost gets way too high in pH, that'll bring your pH down. Um, so optimal pH, I just saw that question because I was just about to mention it, so perfect timing. But your optimal pH typically, especially for vegetable gardening, is 6.5 would be perfect. Maybe even to 7. But usually a good range is 6.2 to 7. So 6.2 to 7 is the perfect range to be in uh, when, you're, when you're talking about uh, pH, especially when we're talking about vegetable gardening. I think a lot of us are doing vegetable gardening. A lot of us are composting for vegetable gardening. Um, and so that's going to be the last thing I'm going to talk about is where to use compost. Now we, So hopefully all of these tips and tricks that I've told you have helped you create a great compost. Um, so what we want to do is um, we, we want to use your we want to use the compost so let's talk about how to use it you can use it in your raised beds so every year when you go to plant you always want to enrich your soil and adding organic matter is a great way to do that so we want to use our compost in our soil um, so we definitely want to, to encourage compost um, uh, into our soil and use it to amend our raised beds. If we're doing vegetable gardening or any kind of ground planting, landscape planting, planting roses, shrubs, trees, perennials, annuals, anything, we always want to amend our soil and compost is the number one ingredient. We want your soil, we definitely want your native soil, but we also want compost in there. And compost is going to, again, break up your soil. If it's a thick, heavy clay soil, it's going to add uh, water holding capabilities. If it's a very loose soil, it's going to add organic matter. And organic matter is super, super, super important when we're planting. Uh, it's also great for lawns. So if we're redoing a lawn, then we, put it, we cut our grass down a little lower in the fall or in the spring. depends on your area and what you're growing. Uh, but you want to want to put down a nice thin layer across the lawn. It's a great place to put new seed onto. It's going to help your seed germinate faster. You can use it as a fertilizer, a plant food for your shrubs, your existing landscape. If you're going to mulch and you got a lot of compost, put down a nice thin layer of compost. We don't want to go thick. So that's kind of another important uh, tip there is we don't want to go two inches, one inch, a half an inch. We typically want to go to a quarter of an inch uh, thick. A half an inch might be okay, but a quarter of an inch is about what we want. So we want to go a thin layer over the lawn, over top of shrub, or you know, around shrubs or perennials. Um, that is going to allow it to decompose a little bit further and not become too hot. Compost heats up, especially when you get your nice fine compost mix. It's going to heat up. We don't want to plant anything directly in compost. So that's another great tip, is if you're putting compost in your raised bed, don't put just compost in there. Compost will heat up, it gets too hot, it's going to decompose, and it becomes muddy over time. So we're always trying to break up our compost, and so that's why in this area what we always recommend when we're planting anything is our soil, a third of our soil, a third of compost, and a third of perlite. Perlite are those little white styrofoamy things you see in uh, potting soil. Perlite is super important, vermiculite is another good option. Uh, so vermiculite or perlite will help break up the soil and de decrease the compaction. So if we're doing raised beds, you don't want to grow straight in compost. You don't want to go straight in topsoil. But you want to mix those two with perlite, peat moss, fluffing up your soil. Think of fluffy, nice soil. Think of a potting soil. What we really want is a potting soil. We don't want to use potting soil, per se, to plant our shrubs or perennials or annuals in the ground or vegetable gardens. Potting soils are designed for pots. So don't use compost in a pot just by itself. It's going to become too hot. It's going to become too rich. It's going to become too muddy. It's going to heat up too much. It's going to cause that root system to rot on you. It's going to hold too much moisture too. So we're always, compost is a soil amendment. So we always want to be amending our soil with it. Compost is great. You can add it to an old potting soil to help thicken up your potting soil if you want to. Um, to, to help kind of reinvigorate your potting soil. But that's what we're using it for is raised beds. 
We're using it for um, lawns as a thin layer. We're using it as a natural fertilizer for our shrubs. And we're using it when we're planting. So that's really what we're using compost for. And we're saving our landfills and we're saving the environment. And it's a fun activity. And like I said, sometimes you're gonna mess up. It's okay. Start over, start from scratch, open up your pile, give it some airflow, turn, turn, turn. Again, probably the most important thing is turning your compost. Very, very important. So I know we've got a lot of questions here. I'm going to go through them all and answer all your questions. I see Jane just asked a question about, uh, can you repeat the one-third compost, one-third regular dirt, one-third vermiculite? Jane, so just to go over that again, whenever we're planting anything in the ground, we have to use our native soil. Plants have to get used to our soil that we're planting in. So you gotta use your soil. You can't just put a really perfect, great soil around it because eventually the root system is going to hit your soil and then it might think it's in a pot. It might actually not be able to break through it. So we want to use our soil, a third our soil, our native ground soil, a third compost. It's going to add organic matter. It's going to add that richness. It's going to add um, a lot of um, uh, that organic matter, that water holding capacity. It's going to break apart our soil. It's going to add all that good stuff. So compost is really important. Perlite or vermiculite is what's going to break it all apart. It's going to loosen it up. It's going to keep it all from compacting. It's going to allow water to percolate down through your soil. It's going to allow the root system to take. And so again, third your soil, third compost, third perlite or vermiculite. So that's the best way to, to amend your soil with compost uh, whenever we're planting in the ground. Uh, all right, so I know we got lots of questions, so I'm going to stop talking and I'm going to start getting to your questions. I'm going to go back all the way to the top if I can. Hopefully we can still see all the questions here and I will start answering all your questions. I hope you enjoyed. If you didn't ask any questions and you're leaving, I'll say goodbye to you. Um, I hope you stick around because a lot of times I'll find some stuff in the questions uh, that I didn't mention and you might find some really good interesting facts. Um, but I will go through all the questions now um, and, and try and get everybody's answered. If you're, if you're taking off, um, have a great day and we'll see you next time and thanks for joining us. If you're sticking around, I'm gonna answer some questions. All right, let's see. I don't know if I can see them all. Let's see if I can change that. It looks like, I mean, I know y'all had a lot of questions, which I knew was gonna happen, which is perfect, which is great. So I might have to go back and, and get some, um, and answer your questions when I get done here, because it looks like I'm only seeing about 20 minutes away. Uh, the questions, so one just disappeared, so uh, I'll answer that. Duck or chicken manure, um, I think was the question. You can use it if you know that you're not giving them anything. If you're not giving them any kind of antibiotics, if you're not giving them any kind of medications, um, then of course you can use it. And again, it's personal preference. Um, it's what you want to do, it's what you want to add. Um, so let's see, Sam said, he said to try and avoid animal manure to anything being grown to eat and to avoid bad odor that will draw pests. So yes, Sam, that, that answers that question. Um, again, it's, it's a smell thing. Um, if, you, if you ever look at, a, at, a, at a fertilizers, um, especially organic fertilizer, it's, it's going to be chicken manure. It's going to be you know, turkey manure uh, based typically. But that is going through a process of dehydration and all these different things. Um, so is it a good source of, of, of nutrients? Yes. But I don't. But, but you got to know what you're giving those animals. Um, that's important to know. Um, and then also, will you be able to handle the smell that it, that it, that, it, that it does? So I usually say, if you're going to do it, probably don't use that compost on edible plants. Um, but again, personal preference. It's up to you, and it's up to what you know. And what you know you're doing. What about fire pit ash? Yes, definitely use it. Ash is awesome. Great source of carbon. Great carbon source. Helps kind of absorb some of that moisture. So Francis said, how long should it take in a tumbler? So I didn't talk about time because time is very, very relative to what you put into it. Tumbling composters can usually produce a compost in about one to two months, so very quickly. So it's probably one of the most efficient ways of composting. Depends on how much you're turning it. So if you're turning it every day, depends on what you're putting in it, depends on how fine it is. So really, there's lots of, lots of different ratios that can be caused there. You can typically get a tumbling composter to be very, very efficient for you um, and to get um, uh, your compost very quickly. Um, so Trish said, I only have food in mind, 
So if that's what you're doing, then you probably are seeing that it's a little wet, a little soggy. You probably need some sort of carbon rich material. So Trish, I would look at your compost and if it's not decomposing, if it's looking a little soggy, if it's smelly, you probably need a carbon rich environment. Um, so Sam is helping me out here. Thanks, Sam. Uh, turning helps reduce gnats. That's true. Um, gnats are going to be kind of a natural part of this. Um, turning helps everything. Turning is just probably, again, one of those biggest things. Knowing the ratio between your nitrogen and your carbon base, but turning, I know it can be kind of backbreaking work, but you got to get your exercise one way or the other. Turn your compost pile. Turn it, turn it, turn it, turn it. Does turning reduce weeds? I kind of mentioned that when I was talking about it. Yes, it does. Uh, again, turning puts materials in different places of the pile. The outer side of your pile is always going to be the coolest spot. That's natural. The inside, the core, is going to be the hottest spot. And that's, if we can get that core up to 140 degrees, then we can kill weed seeds. And so typically weed seeds are going to be smaller, they're typically going to filter down to the bottom, and they're going to heat up the fastest, which is good. Um, just be patient, give it some time. I typically tell people if you're putting weed seeds into your pile, be patient with your compost pile. You typically don't want to keep turning that thing and keep it going for probably four to five months to really make sure that we've killed all those weed seeds. But keep adding stuff to it. Keep doing it. Just keep rolling with it. A lot of times what you'll do is as you're turning, you're going to say, wow, down at the bottom, I've got some really good dirt. So you might pull your pile off, pull that dirt out, put it in a pile. you got your compost pile that's a, that's a much finer grade. Put your other uh, materials back together again and keep on composting. Should I add worms to my tumbler? No, I don't think I would do that. Um, vermicomposting is slightly different. I didn't go into specifics. Um, vermicomposting, they need soil to live in. Um, so Francis, I don't think I'd put the, the worms into my tumbler. Uh, there's not a lot of, uh, the, most tumbling composters should have some holes in it, uh, either on the sides to allow for oxygen to come in, but they're going to want a soil. I mean, with a, with a, with a vermicomposter, what we're typically doing is we're putting in some sort of peat moss, uh, to kind of have a bedding for them, and then we're putting our food scraps in there so that they have a place to live and decompose the other stuff. So Daniel said, when should I stop adding material? Um, depends on, 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 on the process for you. Uh, like I just mentioned, if, if, you, if, you keep, if you're just always constantly adding material, you're always going to be in kind of some different stage of the composting cycle. Um, so again, what I typically find is a lot of the finer stuff is going to work its way down to the bottom of your pile. And eventually I go in, pull my pile off the top, get some of that finer material out. Maybe I'll put that in a separate pile and let it finish decomposing, or maybe it's ready to use. And it typically is. Uh, so it just depends. If you're, if you're just finding yourself, you're just constantly adding stuff to the pile, um, then you might want to start another pile, let the other one finish. Um, or you might find that your, your finer material works down to the bottom typically. So will nitrate of soda break down magnolia leaves? Uh, well, magnolia leaves are a tough one, aren't they? Um, so what I typically recommend with magnolia leaves is if you got a bagger on your mower, pile up all your magnolia leaves and mow over them, that'll shred them. And then nitrate of soda will help but they will break down eventually in a compost pile. Um, some people might just, you might just recommend not using the magnolias uh, in your compost because they do take a while to break down. It's gonna add some length, but it's a great carbon source. Carbon source. What I might do with my magnolia leaves is, and, I, and I've never had magnolia, so I'm not quite sure. Um, I do have it, I take it back, I have a small magnolia, but it doesn't drop a lot of magnolia leaves. If you have a big magnolia and you got a ton of magnolia leaves, and, and I know they're a pain. You might let them brown, let them go to a brown stage, because then that's a great carbon source. But then chip them up somehow, and I think probably mowing over them with, a, with your mower and bagging those chips um, is a great way. You can mow over them, of course, and just blow them into a pile. If it shoots out the side, rake them up. But that'll be a great source, but you do want to grind them up a little bit. I think that will help, because they're so big and chunky, just that one leaf can be that big, um, that you're going to want to break it down a little bit. Charcoal ash from grilling, can that be used? Um, yes, it, it certainly can. Um, charcoal is not a, I, charcoal is a tough one. Um, if it's just a perfectly, you know, used up charcoal, uh, charcoal can be used. 
uh, in gardening for sure. And it can be used in the, um, with grilling, you're fine. You're gonna obviously have some drippings of fat in there. I would not use the charcoal that already has the lighter fluid in it. That would be the one that you would stay away from. But if you're using just regular charcoal and you're not using lighter fluid to get it started, I think you're fine. Uh, but if you are using a lighter fluid to get it started, I typically would stay away from that charcoal. So kind of depends on how you're using your charcoal. Trish said mine is mostly coffee grounds. Well, that's good. Coffee grounds are carbon-based. So that's your carbon-based. And if you're using other plant matter, if you're using other uh, food waste products, then I think you could be good. Again, it's, it's all about your, um, your ratio and making sure your ratio is right. So Caitlin said, I basically have a pile I haven't touched in months. Inexperienced, I'll start turning it. Is it still usable? Should I scoop it and start over? I, I, sure, it's perfectly fine. I mean, that's great. It's okay to have a pile that's just been sitting there. A lot of us, I mean, if you've got big spaces, you might have multiple piles that you're starting in different stages. If it's just sitting there, it's fine. It's not a problem. You do need to start turning it if you want to start using it. Because typically what's going to happen is you're going to have a lot of, of green product typically in the, in the inside. And then um, it's going to be very thick. It's going to probably have, you know, it's going to be in different stages of composting uh, depending on, on where the pile is. Um, but but that, that would be perfectly fine to use. Use that compost, turn it, just start turning it, you'll start to see it, and I really think you'll, you'll uh, have some, some success with it. What's the ideal pH, Bren, uh, Brenda Ann said? Uh, ideal, uh, what pH level is ideal? Um, I, I, I mentioned that, so 6.3 to 7 is usually ideal for most plants. Depends on where you live and what you're growing. Uh, but in this area, it's 6.3 to 7, especially for vegetable gardening. Again, it depends on what plants you're around. I mean, if you're growing azaleas, they like it a little bit more acidic. If you're growing blueberries, they like it way more acidic. Uh, it can become very specific. You can look up your list easily online uh, to find all those different information out. Um, but, uh, but, but usually ideal is 6.2 to 7, 6.3 to 7, somewhere in that range. Rachel said, very informative, great. I put lots of coffee grounds too. Coffee grounds are great. Great source of carbon, awesome. I heard those meters aren't very accurate. Jane, I think I mentioned that. Um, yeah, they're not, they're not super accurate. Um, they're not 100% my favorite thing. Of course, we have a more scientific uh, way of doing pH. So if you live in the area, we do free pH tests. If you don't, most of your local garden centers should do free pH testing, um, or they might charge a very small amount. If not, you can send off a soil sample to your extension agent. Everybody's got an extension agent across the country. Look them up on, on the website, uh, and you can usually send a little box of soil to them, and they'll do an analysis. What you're going to get back is going to be super, super you know, detailed when all you're looking for is pH. So sometimes this will get you close, which is okay. But no, they're not accurate. They're not 100% accurate. Um, what should be the pH we're aiming for? Again, 6.3 to 7. So would maybe a 1 to 5 pH level be, would be ideal. Um, so 1 to 5 pH is pretty low. Depends on the area you are in and depends on what we're growing. Uh, but 1 to 5 would be pretty low. Yep, so she, and then uh, I think that you know, we were talking about that a little bit. Uh, trees like it around 5.5. Yes, most trees in our area, pine trees, maples, uh, magnolias, uh, oaks, they all like it around 5.5. Typically in our area, our soil is naturally, in the Hampton Roads area, our soil is naturally around a 5.5. That is our natural. And so that's why a lot of us are adding lime, magical or dolomitic lime, to bring our pH up in this area because we're trying to grow vegetables or other plants. Um, but most of the plants that you're going to buy in our garden center, especially shrubs um, and perennials, the plants that are going to be around for a while, and even annuals, are typically going to be fine in a fairly low pH. So you don't typically have to worry about your pH too much. It's just always good to know. And I'll mention this real quick for everybody that's still watching. What pH does for you is if you're in the right range of pH, so if the plant that you're planting let's say a tomato plant, uh, and we're in a 6.5, then when you apply a fertilizer, when you apply a plant food to that tomato, it can use all of it. But if we're in a 4.5, if we're two points off, and that tomato plant looks like it's struggling, and you apply a plant food to it to help it, it can only get 20% of that plant food. Now, if we're not applying plant foods, there's natural nutrients in the soil. It can't get to them. 
So that's why we talk about pH all the time. It's because in the right range of pH, if we're in a good range of our pH, then the plant can get nutrients out of the soil naturally and out of the plant foods we're applying. You're wasting your plant foods if your pH isn't in the right level. So that's why pH is so important. Oh, Carrie, thank you. Very nice comment. Um, everybody's saying great information. So I bet I missed a ton of questions, but I'm sure there's probably more out there, and so I'm going to keep on going. But if I, if I missed your question because it fell off my screen, I'm going to go back after we're done with this and answer all your questions. I'll go right up and start doing that as soon as I'm done. So another good question, Susan said, if you're continuously adding your compost pile, when is it ready to use? So again, it's kind of, that's, that's the downfall, if there ever was one to a compost pile, it doesn't cost you any money, is that you might need to start another compost pile and let the other one finish. Or like I said, usually the finer material, the heavier material typically works down to the bottom. Take the looser stuff off the top that's still decomposing, harvest your compost from down below, put the stuff back on top and you're good to go again. So hopefully that helps you. So can I add compost or a compost tea in my garden now that it's planted? Yes. So if you've already planted your, your, your vegetables or your ornamental plants or anything around your yard, you can put down compost as a plant food. It's a great option. I didn't talk about compost tea much. Uh, compost tea typically you can get from a vermicompost or if it's got a port down at the bottom. Tumbling composters typically have a way of getting that compost tea out. So if you're draining moisture out, uh, it's a great way of doing it. Um, you can do composting tea by yourself if that's something you want to do. If you've got a compost mix that's decomposing, you can take it and put it in a burlap bag, drop it in a bucket of water, let it sit for three days, take the bag out, put it back in the compost pile, and then you've got yourself some compost tea. But compost tea is a good one. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a water-based plant food. You can definitely use it. All of your composting nutrients are going to be good. Put a thin layer of compost down. If it's a finished compost that's ready to be used, put a thin layer down around your plants. Perfect. You can put it underneath the mulch. You can put it on top of the mulch. I definitely recommend underneath the mulch. Um, I think it just looks better. The compost on top is going to take a while to decompose uh, before you start to filter its way down through the, the mulch. Um, and it's going to decompose the mulch on top faster. Uh, old mulch, I didn't even talk about that. Old mulch is a great way. If you're stripping all the old mulch out of your, your uh, uh, flower beds and you're putting new mulch in, which I don't necessarily recommend. You don't have to typically. Uh, but if you are, that's a great brown carbon source. It's a great option there. We have several compost areas in our yard. How long should one compost area ripen before it's usable? So again, it's all to the eye. It's to what you think. Um, if, if, you're, if your ratio is right and it looks like it's decomposing, you're turning it relatively quickly. Um, like I said, somewhere between that two to three month time frame, maybe five or six months, depends on how much you're turning. So many environmental factors, so many variables, how fine you're chopping the material. But what you want, and I did grab this, I didn't show this earlier. I don't know that you'll be able to see this on the camera. What you want is a fine material, a soil looking material. You want it to be somewhat chunky, but it's up to you again. If, if it's a little bit more chunky, but you want to use it, that's okay. Um, but you typically want it to look like dirt. You know, you want it to be like a dirty look. I mean, you want it to look like dirt. You don't want it to have a lot of smell. You want it to have kind of a gardeny, you know, dirt smell. So it's again, it's all to the eye. It's to the touch, to the feel. Um, you know, so that, that's a hard question to answer because there's a lot of different variables that come into play. But you'll know, get in there, turn it. Once you feel like it's usable material, use it. I'm sure you're fine. If it's been sitting for long enough, I'm sure you're fine. And if it's been turned enough, you should be good. So pecan, walnut, husk, green or brown? Uh, brown, for sure, brown. Dry, think dry, brown is usually dry. So Jeff, uh, you can definitely use pecan. Black walnuts, I didn't mention that. Black walnuts, you don't wanna use. You don't wanna use the leaves off of black walnuts. You don't want to use branches. You don't want to use black walnut husks. Um, not that typically we're eating a lot of black walnuts, but black walnuts um, have a, have a um, I can't remember now off the top of my head what it is, but there's something in black walnuts that is not good for soil and actually sterilizes soil or makes it not able to grow much. And that's why you typically don't see anything growing on a black walnut tree. So if you have a black walnut tree, don't use any of that brown or green material for sure. Uh, but yes, pecan and other walnut husk, perfectly fine. And that is a brown. Thanks for a great lesson. Great. Good to hear. I'm glad everybody is saying thank you. What about banana peels? Yes, so 
I didn't talk about peels a lot. This is a, a touchy subject. It depends on, again, personal preference. Uh, peels in general. Banana peels, apple peels, peach peels are probably the most important ones. That's what we're typically peeling the most. Uh, cucumber peels. Uh, depends on what you're peeling. But if you're buying it from the supermarket, why do we wash them off <laughs> before we use it? Because there might be some sort of insecticide on it. Um, and so that's the problem there, is then we don't know what we're putting in our compost pile. I typically say don't worry about it or wash it off. So if you're about to peel your banana, wash off your banana peel real good. You're not going to eat it anyways. Take your banana out when you have the banana peel, chop it up, put it in the compost pile. I think it's perfectly fine. Most of the insecticides that growers are using these days will burn off if the compost gets to the highest degree. Again, it's just personal preference. It's what you feel and it's what you're comfortable with. Um, I personally don't think it's a problem, um, but a, a lot of people are peeling peaches and apples and bananas and cucumbers and different fruits and vegetables. I use them. Uh, I just always wash my fruit off, and that typically helps uh, eliminate some of that. I mean, instead of just, I think a lot of us just take our apples and just run it under some water, take it and really rub it, and then really kind of, you know, wash it off real good with a, with a paper towel. Um, and then throw the paper towel away and that usually is going to make it pretty safe for you to eat and peel and put in your compost pile. Um, are you familiar with African Keyhole Gardening? I just recently read about it and didn't quite understand that book's explanation, but is that basically like the compost tea idea that you mentioned? Um, I don't know. Um, I, I'm not familiar with African Keyhole Gardening. Love to learn new things, so I get to go look that up and find out what that is. Um, I, I know about compost tea. There's lots of different compost tea ideas. Again, most of your tumbling composters or your verma composters, uh, any kind of, of bin composter, they might have compost tea faucets at the bottom. And basically what compost tea is, is the moisture that's wicking through, that's in there, has, is pulling those nutrients through as well. And you put it into a, to a, a watering can and you water your plants with it. And it's a great byproduct. You can also make your own compost tea. I know a lot of people that will take leaves especially in a pile of leaves that are kind of decomposing by themselves, put them in a burlap sack, put them in a five gallon bucket of water, let it sit there for a few days, and you've made a compost tea. It's gonna be light, it's not gonna be super, super strong, uh, but that's an option uh, to make your own compost tea if you want, especially if you're working in a pile for a compost pile. Uh, but I'll have to look up that one, and, and Tabitha, I'll have to get back to you on that one. That's a good question. I'll have to learn what uh, African keyhole gardening is. Interesting. Can you use lava rock instead of perlite? Yes, you can. It depends on how fine it is. Um, if it's super, super big pieces of lava rock, I don't know that I'd recommend it, but yes. I mean, perlite is, 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 a, is a volcanic glass that's basically uh, put into uh, to a firing pit and fired to the point where it pops. Uh, so lava rock would be perfectly fine. Rock is fine. Anything that's going to not break down the soil for a long time, um, and those all do that vermiculite, perlite, rock, would work as well. So if you've got a, a big source of small lava rock or crushed up lava rock, the bigger the chunks, not going to quite break up your soil as much. You want it to be pretty fine or finer um, than, a, than a, you know, an inch sized lava rock. But good question. But yes, rock definitely works, Jen. So that would work. Lava rock is a great option. Uh, Reba said, dry floor under trees. Can I use compost to make a richer soil for planting shade plants? Definitely. Compost in a shade garden is a must. So when we've got big trees, big old trees, not only will they love the compost, it's going to enrich your soil. It's going to add organic matter that that tree has absorbed. And it's going to give you the ability to plant shrubs and, and shade plants, which I'm actually doing in a couple weeks. Um, and I'll talk about that in that, in that seminar um, as to what you can plant in those areas. But, uh, but adding organic matter is very, very important if we're trying to plant under big old shade trees, for sure. One, the hard part is trying to dig the hole. But putting in organic matter is going to help, for sure, uh, with your shade plants. Yes, Tina, you can uh, direct message us with questions if you have any, um, and I'll answer them. Is balancing moisture the main reason for one part green, two parts brown? Um, yes, that is. That's pretty much it. I mean, it's, it's, all, it's all moisture. Um, are there other important reasons? No, not necessarily. I mean, really, the, the carbon-rich brown material is going to absorb some moisture, and then the green material is going to release the moisture, the green nitrogen-based material. So, so that, that's, that's why we do two parts brown to one part green. Um, so great question. It's mainly due to the moisture. 
So if we're too soggy, we're adding more brown. If we're too dry, we can add more green or we can water. Um, so great, great question, Amy. Uh, definitely that, that's, that's the reason for it. Coffee grounds are okay, Cindy. Definitely. Brown material, good option. Tea bags, yes, tea bags can go in there. So tea is actually a brown um, material, um, and the tea bag will be as well. Rabbit manure, Carolyn asked. Uh, depends on if, again, if you're giving rabbits anything. And so, again, it's personal preference. Is it going to smell? Is it going to cause issues? Um, those, are, those are the questions you got to kind of have to ask yourself. And, and so, again, it's, it's personal preference. Um, Anna said citrus peels. So, again, kind of like I just mentioned with peels, citrus peels are perfectly fine. Chop them up nice and fine. I think you're okay. If you're worried about that they were sprayed with pesticides, personal preference. Up to you. Wash off your fruit before you eat it then chop up your peels, I think you're okay. Again, personal preference. There's, there's a lot of variables here. Uh, so I don't want to kind of be, I, I want to be in the middle, I want to say both ways. Be safe, better safe than sorry, always. Um, but if you're comfortable with it, go for it. Where is the best place to start your compost pile in your yard? How far away from your house? Should it be in a sunny or shady spot? Great question, Lisa. It can be in a sunny or shady spot. It doesn't necessarily matter. Uh, shady spots are going to stay cooler typically, so you're obviously going to take a little bit longer. I will personally say I don't care about the distance necessarily. Uh, I usually want it out of sight. So I usually put it behind a shed um, in an area where I don't see it necessarily because it's not going to be super, super uh, pretty. Now, composting is, is, is movable too. So next year I might do my vegetable garden over here. It's a nice sunny spot. I'm going to build my pile over here. I'm going to compost over here this year. And then I'm going to use that compost. All those nutrients are going to make that soil underneath very rich. So then I'll move my compost pile somewhere else next year. I'll use up the compost. I'll make my compost pile there. Then maybe I'll start another pile halfway through the year in another location. You can do that as you move around. It's just take a little. I always say with anything gardening, take a little bit of time, a little bit of planning goes a long way. Great question. Sun or shade is perfectly fine. If you want it closer to the house, that's okay. Again, it depends on what you're putting in it. If you're using yard waste, uh, you are typically fine. If you're using a little bit of food scraps, you might encourage more pests. Um, because if it's just a pile, we're going to get raccoons. We're going to get some mice. We're going to get some different things that are going to be digging through it. And that's okay. I don't have a problem with it. Um, I'm not encouraging a lot. And I typically, when I put my green stuff in, I put my brown stuff over top of it. And I'm turning, and I'm turning, and I'm turning, and that keeps the, the varmints away. Um, but great question. You can really do it anywhere. It doesn't matter. Can I add compost or compost tea to my garden now that it's planted? Yes. Definitely. I think I answered your question earlier, Brenda, so hopefully, maybe you were just asking again because I mentioned earlier that I might not see everybody's. Um, how does one enclose a pile? So if you're doing a pile, do it directly on the bare ground. Start with your brand material. You can enclose it on the sides and the back. I typically would enclose the whole thing. And you got some options. Cinder block, uh, wood, you can just build a wood frame around it. Um, you can use wire fencing um, with those wire posts, just like a dog fencing or any kind of thing like that. I typically like the smaller the hole. So usually like a dog fencing or a pet fencing is somewhere around like a two by two, three by three square hole. Uh, rectangular hole, um, and those work perfectly fine just to keep that the bulk of that material inside. Um, again, you don't have to, but if you feel like you want to enclose it, that's how you typically enclose it. And then I don't build a roof on it necessarily. I usually just use a tarp. So Heather, I hope that helps with, with that. Uh, so Penny said, very informative. Great. I'm glad. Uh, thanks for joining us from Hartford, North Carolina. Uh, are there certain types of woods that we would not want to add to our pile? Not really. Um, I mean, I, I probably wouldn't use pressure treated wood. Like if I'm if I'm shredding up a pressure treated wood now, if you've had it for a while, it's probably fine. Um, and um, the wood from um, a black walnut. That's that's about it. Other than that, I think you're fine. Um, cedar, cypress, wood. I mean, it, it really shouldn't matter. Um, just as long as it hasn't been treated with anything. Um, and there's Cindy saying never use treated wood. So yeah, I mean, treated wood, it's been treated obviously with a chemical to, to prevent it from rotting for a long time. Um, and then you're going to be talking about shredding it. So I don't even know how you would shred a big 4x4 four four piece of treated wood. So I wouldn't use that. Um, if you've got like an old fence panel that's like, you know, 40 years old and it's falling apart and it's easy to break up, I think you're fine there. Um, but if, if you know that it's been treated with something and it's been a fairly new wood, uh, 
I wouldn't use that. Now you can use, I, I personally think you can use treated wood to create a flower bed um, or uh, even a raised bed, uh, it's personal preference. But cedar is a great option, pine is a great option. There's lots of different things out there that you can look up um, and use for wood options. But when putting in your compost pile, treated wood, I wouldn't use. What does ready to use compost look like? So Mary, I hope you saw that uh, when I showed that kind of, and I didn't show it during the seminar because again, compost is, it's up to you. This is pretty fine. I don't know if you can see that. That's pretty fine. So that's a pretty fine material. You can see I got a couple chunks in there that are about this big. I got, you know, another little chunk in there that's a little bit bigger. Uh, but you want it to look like a dirt. Um, you know, a good option is to buy a compost, come in and buy a McDonald, a bag of McDonald compost and look at it and say, okay, that's about the degree of what I want it to get. Um, and that's, that's really important is just to kind of know it and kind of feel it. Um, the finer the material, the better. The, the thicker the material might be good for if you've got a very clay heavy soil and you want to uh, break apart your soil, a chunkier mix might work really well. Just depends and it depends on what you want. And again, trial and error. It, the, the, you just, what, what you want is it to look like dirt. You don't want it to look like, oh, well, I can still see there's a piece of carrot in there and there's a piece of, because then it's still decomposing and it's releasing nitrogen or using nitrogen and those different types of things to break down. Uh, so we don't want to add those straight there um, into our soil. But if it looks like a soil, smells like a soil, it's a soil, and use that. Frog said, thanks about the magnolia leaves. Good, I hope that helps. Yes, uh, Francis, this will be available to view after we're done. So if you need to go back and kind of, you know, get some of those uh, tips and tricks or kind of review some things, uh, the video will be posted on our Facebook page as well as our website. And give us about four or five days. We'll get all these notes up on the website as well. So all of my notes uh, we'll put into a nice document so you can print it off. It'll be a PDF. You can save it on your computer, save it on your phone, and always have it there. Um, what cover can be used on a compost pile made out of chicken wild to keep out pests? Um, so, I, again, you're going to probably have pests. Depends on what you're putting it in there. Um, turning it, I always think, helps. Um, you're going to have pests, that, and that's the thing, is, is you're just going to have to. If you don't want pests, don't use food scraps. Um, what kind of roof can you put on it? Um, you, can put, you can build a roof if you want to. I like a tarp. Personally, just putting a tarp over it, putting some bricks on, on it to keep the pest out, that, that can be kind of a, a bit of a pain. Um, just my personal thing is, Arlene, it's just realize you're probably going to have pests a little bit. Um, keep it a little bit further away from your house if, if need be. If they're getting really bad, we can try spraying it with repellents. There's lots of natural and organic repellents that you can use out there um, that won't hurt your soil, won't hurt your compost, won't hurt you. Uh, just repels the pests. Um, so a couple different options there for you, um, but I personally like my pile to be exposed because I don't want to have to water it. I want to let the natural uh, sunlight and the natural water uh, work for me, and then I can always control it by just throwing a tarp over the top of it. Everybody's saying, thank you, thank you, good, good, good. I noticed that my avocado skins don't decay well. Should I leave them out? Uh, if you are, great question, Jason, and great thing, and the pits too. Um, so the pits are pretty big on avocados, uh, so you might not use those. Um, uh, the avocado uh, skins, if you chop them up a little bit finer, it might help. But great point, Jason, is, is trial and error. If you're finding that things aren't decaying and, and, and decomposing very well, you might avoid that one. You might find other ones that are doing much better, and you might try different things. Again, it's trial and error. It's finding out what works best for you. I've never heard that avocado skins are bad for compost. I can't imagine they are. It's just an organic uh, plant-based material, um, so it shouldn't be bad. It's a green. It's for sure green, nitrogen. Uh, maybe chop it up smaller, finer chops, uh, finer pieces. will probably break up a little bit better, um, and then probably leaving the seeds out. I think I saw a question that fell off my list earlier about like the apple cores and seeds like that. I think those are fine. I put them in there. Not a problem at all. The finer the seed, it's okay. Again, most of the times we're, we're, we're reaching for a high temperature. We're, we're aiming for a nice high temperature. We're turning our compost. We're, we're encouraging the, the turning and that, that heat and that core will burn off those seeds and, and prevent them from ever germinating. My compost is being raided by fruit flies, larvae, and maggots. What can I do at this point? So maggots um, are a natural part of this process. T 
turning it will help them from your eyes, eyesight. Uh, so turning Lewis might help. Um, but yeah, I mean maggots are going to be in decaying food. It's perfectly normal. Flies, larvae. Cover them with a the carbon source. That would be my best advice. You got a lot of grain there. All of those things are probably from green sources. So add a carbon base. So cover it with some leaf litter. Cover it with uh, even soil if you've got soil laying around. Um, cover it with those brown cardboard boxes. Uh, chop them up real fine. Put them in there. Um, material, any of that brown carbon-based material that I was mentioning earlier. That's what you need to help control that issue, but also just to hide it. I mean, part of that is somewhat natural. You're going to get it. It's part of it. It's part of the decomposition process. Turning, number one thing. Keep turning it. Keep moving it. Put some brown material over the top of it. Make sure things aren't matting and becoming uh, thick. Uh, so, so hopefully that helps with that. And then, of course, if it's smelly, then the lime is your best option. So, Caitlin said, Jason, I would chop them. So, maybe that will help. So, Belinda said, I started a, com a compost pile months ago in a receptacle that I turn every few days. The material has been extremely slow to decompose. What am I doing wrong? Just bought some compost starter. Will that help? Yes, the compost starter will help. Making sure that your ratios are correct. Um, you might have too much brown material, which is rare, but usually that can happen. So, Belinda, if you've got too much brown material, you might need to add some water. Because if it's a covered receptacle, um, which it sounds like it probably is, um, then you might not be adding enough green and you got more brown. So checking your ratio might help with that. Um, the compost starter will definitely help. Um, you might move it to a sunnier location if, if it's in a shady spot. The sun will help heat it up as well. Um, but adding a little bit of moisture is typically probably going to be the problem there. Or, or maybe it's too moist. Um, it's not decomposing, but typically um, it's probably you got too much brown material is what it sounds like. The compost starter is going to help you, but add some green would be my guess, or add some water. Location of pile, Reba, so I kind of answered that earlier. Um, Reba, the, the location of the pile um, depends on really you. Again, I kind of like it out of sight and out of mind a little bit, or not out of mind. I kind of want to constantly turn it, um, but I kind of want it out of sight. I don't want to be able to see it. You know, my kitchen window, I don't want to be looking across my backyard and see a big compost pile. So if you can hide it, great, but really it can go anywhere. It can move, it can change, you can do anything with it. So it's very, very important for you to know that, that you can do them pretty much anywhere. Just wanted to say thank you for all this great info. Great. Uh, Joe, thank you. We will definitely use it in the future. This year I built a large raised garden, purchased three pickup loads of bulk topsoil and compost um, and perlite. So you, you came by and you got a bunch of stuff. Um, it's a great mixture and the garden is growing fast. You are you guys are great. Thanks again. Thank you, Joe. Thanks for shopping with us. And start a compost pile and you can help amend your soil over the years. So you'll have a great uh, at-home mixture if you want to. And again, we're always here if you need compost. If you say, whoa, this is way too much for me, you can always buy compost. And that helps the environment and helps your garden out as well. Um, great. Christine, I'm glad you enjoyed it. Mallory said to lower pH, use sulfate. To bring it up, use lime calcium. Right. Right on. Bring it up. Typically in this area, we're trying to bring it up. So Magical brings it up fast, does it very quickly. Agricultural limestone or dolomitic lime is going to bring it up slower, but it works very well too. So you got lime or Magical, calcium based, lime based. Those are both great ways to bring your soil up in pH. To bring it down, aluminum sulfate or sulfur, soil sulfur, is going to bring your pH down. Um, Espoma makes a great organic product called Soil Acidifier. Um, so great if you need to bring your pH down if we got too high of a pH. Brenda Ann said, thank you. Is there a resource you can recommend on green versus brown materials? Um, so Talon, um, let's see, I can't remember. I think it's Earthway um, is a really good resource. Let's see if I can find it real quick on my phone. So eartheasy.com. So check out eartheasy.com. They're really good. I'm going to have my notes posted that will have a whole list of all the, the brown and, and green ingredients. Um, but we talked about all of them. Um, and, um, and so we'll have those notes posted. You can do some good research. Earth Easy is a company um, that when we used to buy composters, like I said, I don't buy as many anymore. I am the buyer. Um, and I bought like the vermicomposters, the can of worms, the tumbleweeds. 
um, just for something new. We're always doing new different things to keep the product mix different. Um, and we go out and hand pick all these different items. But Earth Easy is a great company. They have a lot of different types of composters, huge composting company. So maybe check out eartheasy.com, Talon. Hopefully that helps you. And then you said, is it a good idea to add old soil to your compost pile? Definitely. Awesome option. Um, I didn't mention that, but that's a great option. Soil, a lot of people are trying to reinvigorate their soil, but if you got an old potting soil, throw it in your compost pile. It's a great option. Great point. Debbie said, thanks, thank you. Can old dairy products be composted? Um, uh, yes and no. Again, it's kind of personal preference. I, I can't imagine it being a problem, so I don't know if we're talking about like, you know, butters or creams and, and old milk. Um, shouldn't be a problem. Um, again, that's, that's a green material. It's typically gonna, that's gonna add a lot of moisture, so you're gonna have a lot, you're gonna need to add a lot of brown, a lot of that carbon base. Um, but but um, shouldn't be a problem because again, if you're uh, those, those are natural products, no issue that, that I can see coming from it, um, and those are going to compose uh, decompose very quickly as well. Jane said, "Can you make this video available again?" Yes, you can. Um, uh, so yes, this video will be on our Facebook page as well as our website, along with the notes, uh, McDonaldGardenCenter.com. Carrie said, do you do these talks often? We do them twice, a, we've been doing them twice a week. We've got a ton of them posted on our website. Um, you can check them out there. Um, if you go to mcdonaldgardencenter.com, you can find them there and they've got all their notes attached to them. So Carrie, if, if you wanna know what we've talked about in the past, I think we've got about 13 or 14 of them up there. Uh, we've got our Facebook page that has a lot of them as well uh, and we're gonna continue to do them. So I've got hydrangeas slated for next week. Uh, we've got shade gardening that we're gonna talk about. I'm gonna do a terrarium. The talks, I mean, the possibilities are endless. I'll keep on doing this as long as I possibly can. Mary, thank you for joining. Yeah, so Francis makes a good point. Make sure the tea bags aren't infused with plastic to make them last longer. That's a good question. I mean, that's a good point. Any, and I didn't mention that. Any plastics that we can avoid putting in there is great. Um, if, we can, it's a, if we can prevent plastics going into our compost pile, it's a huge, huge step. Uh, what is the best resource to tell what is green versus brown? Talon said, so I mentioned that eartheasy.com is a great option. My notes will be up on the website in about, hopefully by Monday or Tuesday of next week if we can get them done. Can you start a compost pile on a shredded oak tree stump area? For sure, definitely. That's a lot of brown material, so you might actually dig some of that out and put it off to the side so you have a little bit of extra brown. Put some green in there, mow your grass, put some green in the hole, Fill it back in with that, that shredded oak uh, uh, material. But yes, Mary, you can definitely do it on that. Heat treated pallets are a de decent option if you can find them. So Talon, yeah, that, that's a good point. Pallets are tricky. Uh, I don't mention pallet wood or pallets in general. Uh, you know, pallet gardening was a craze there a while. I just don't know what was shipped on that pallet. So we ended up, when we did pallet gardening a few years ago when that was the craze, we built our own pallets out of, out of just regular pine. Um, untreated pine. So, uh, so pallets are tricky. Uh, you just want to make sure if, if you know what was shipped on it because I mean you just never know what's been shipped on that pallet and if it leaked onto it and you just don't know what's in there. So pallets are tricky. Um, Tom said, great comments. I've been in Virginia Beach for years. Now you're in Alaska. Tom from Alaska. Thanks for joining. Um, I'm glad you learned a lot. Uh, Jeannie said, this has been great. Learned a lot. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you for joining. Everybody's saying thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you, thank you. I don't know if I see any more questions. Are weeds bad to compost? Weeds are not bad to compost. Weeds are a good green nitrogen source. The bad thing, Talon, is they might have weed seeds on them. And so what we want to do is make sure that we're turning, 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 turning our compost, trying to get those weed seeds to the center and keep them turning so that they can heat up and that they become sterile and they won't grow anymore. So, uh, so, so definitely keep turning your compost. Uh, but weeds are a great green source. So I think I got through everybody's questions that I could see. I know there's a lot of questions out there that I missed. I will get back to those um, as soon as I possibly can. Thank you all for joining. This was great. I had a lot of fun talking about compost. Uh, we've got lots of topics can, uh, that, that are coming up, and we'll continue to do these. Everybody stay safe. We'll be here for you. If you ever need anything, ask us a question. We're here for you. Have a great day. Enjoy this great weekend. If you're here in Virginia, the weather looks cool. Looks like spring is still here. Uh, we just had a little bit of rain. That's okay. The garden needs the rain. 
Looks like it's going to be a gorgeous weekend um, with, with some nice cold temperatures. And I hope everybody watching from uh, across the United States and, and around the world, I hope you enjoy this and I hope you got something out of it. Um, and uh, continue to see us and stay safe and be good out there and enjoy your garden. Uh, have a great day. See you later.